let's demonstrate this process of partial fraction expansion and then using the tables to take the expanded function back into the time domain. So for example, right here we have some function f of s. The numerator polynomial is here, the denominator polynomial is there. It is a proper fun fraction. In other words, the order of the numerator is less than the order of the denominator. If that were not the case, we would do a long division and remove out the non-fractional or the non-rational terms and then expand the remainder portion, which would be a proper fraction. fraction. So, using partial fraction expansion, you'll recall from college algebra that, and also note, first of all, that we have factored both the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial. So we're now ready to break this out into its partial fractions, and here you'll recall that this thing here can be expanded into the form of a k1, some constant k1 over s, plus another constant k2 over s plus 8, plus k3 over s plus 6. In other words, we write a partial fraction term for each of the factors in the denominator of the function that we're wanting to expand. Our purpose now, then, is to get or calculate k1, k2, and k3. There are a number of different ways of doing this. For this type of function, it's very simple to calculate each of the um, constants individually by multiplying both sides of this equation by each of these roots individually and then evaluating, or by each of these factors, and then by evaluating the zero associated with each of those factors. In other words, it's easier to, to do it than to say. Let's start out by multiplying both sides of this equation by the factor s. When we do that, I'll have an s term here. I'll have an s term here, an s term here, and an s term here. You'll notice that on this side, the s terms cancel. The s terms here cancel. They don't cancel here or here. So I've multiplied both sides of the function by this factor s. I'm now going to evaluate both sides of the function at the value of s, or the, the zero value associated with that factor. So the factor s, the zero associated with that is zero. So I'm going to evaluate both sides at s equals zero. Of course, here I just have k1 left. Over here, I have k2 times s, but I'm evaluating at s equals zero. This term here is going to go to zero. This term here is going to go to zero. And over here, I've got then 96 times zero plus five is five, times zero plus 12 is 12. Down in the denominator, the s is canceled. So I'm left with zero plus eight is eight and 0 plus 6 is 6. Over here on the right-hand side, I'm left simply with k1. You go through and evaluate that, you'll find that k1 is equal to 120. Well, that was pretty slick. Let's see now if we can't, well, we can. We can evaluate k2 and k3 by going through a similar process. To get k2, which is a constant over the s plus 8 term, we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by s plus 8, and then evaluate what's left at the value of the 0 for s plus 8, which is s equals minus 8. So s plus 8 times f of s evaluated at s equals minus 8. We're going to have, on this left-hand side, we're going to have 96 times s equals minus 8, so it'll be a minus 8 plus 5, times minus 8 plus 12. Down in the denominator, because I multiplied both sides by s plus 8, I'll have an s plus 8 term here and an s plus 8 term here that's going to cancel, just as the s terms canceled in a previous step. So I'm going to have an s term evaluated at minus 8. The s plus 8 terms will have canceled, and I'll have this s plus 6 term evaluated at minus 8 plus 6. That's the left side of this equation. Over here on the right-hand side, I'm going to have a k1 
times s plus 8 evaluated at s equals minus 8, or I'm going to have a minus 8 plus 8 term there over s plus, now this term, because I multiplied this side by the s plus 8, the s plus 8 has a factor in the denominator of s plus 8 that cancels it, leaving me, well, it's all right, k2 times s plus 8 over s plus 8, if you will. point is that they cancel, leaving the k2 all alone. Plus then k3 times s plus 8, evaluated at s equals minus 8. So I'll have a um, minus 8 plus 8 over s plus 6 evaluated at s equals minus 8, or a minus 8 plus 6 term in the denominator. Now, the minus 8 plus 8, that's a 0, so this term goes to 0. Similarly, this term goes to 0, and I'm left with k2 on this side of the equation is equal to 96, and let's see, negative 8 plus 5 is a negative 3, negative 8 plus 12 is a, is a positive 4, down here, I've got a negative 8 and a negative 2, which when you evaluate those, you'll find that k2 ends up being equal to negative 72. So we've evaluated the k1 term working with the s factor. We've now evaluated the k2 term working with the s plus 8 factor. We can now calculate k3 doing the same thing, only working with the s plus 6 factor. So I'll have then s plus 6 times f of s evaluated at s equals negative 6. On the left hand side the s plus 6 terms are going to cancel and I'm left with 96 times s plus 5 but s is being evaluated at a negative 6 so it'll be a negative 6 plus 5 times again negative 6 plus 12 divided by, I've got an s term, negative 6. The s plus 8 factor is still in there, so that will be a negative 6 plus 8. And then this s plus 6 factor will have canceled by the s plus 6 factor that we multiplied both sides by. So this becomes the left-hand side of the equation. On the right-hand side, we're going to have a k1 times s plus 6, but s is being evaluated at negative 6, will be a negative 6 plus 6 divided by s plus k2 times s plus 6, which is negative 6 plus 6, divided by s plus 8. And then we will have the third term, which is k3 times s plus 6, but I've got a factor of s plus 6 in the denominator, so those terms cancel, and as we had in the past, the constant stands alone. Going through and evaluating this, you'll find that k3 is equal to 48. And we now have one, two, three constants. And we can now write f of s in its expanded partial fraction form. It's k1 over s. We found k1 to be 120 over s plus k2 over s plus 8, we found k2 to be negative 72 over s plus 8, plus k3, which we found to be 48, over s plus 6. That's the expanded form. In this form, we're now ready to use our Laplace transform tables to identify time domain functions associated with each of these terms. Looking back to our Laplace transform table, we see that 1 over s is associated with or has a corresponding time domain function of u of t. We have some constant over s plus a that corresponds to that same constant times e to the minus a t in the time domain. So using that, Coming back here to this, this term right here, 120 over s, in the time domain, we can write this now as f of t is equal to, this is going to be 120 times our step function u of t. All right, coming back here, 
a 1 over S term goes to U of T, a K over S term would go to K times U of T. This term right here is a minus 72 divided by S over 8, coming back here, constant over S plus A corresponds to this constant times e to the minus at, where the, the uh, coefficient in the exponent is the opposite sign of the uh, frequency shifted value, this a value here. So coming back here, we've got s plus 8. This 1 over s plus 8 then goes to an e to the minus 8t u of t plus, similarly, 48. This also is going to transform back in the time domain, or correspond in the time domain, to a, an exponential term, or 48 e to the minus 6 t u of t. We write in these u of t terms to remind ourselves, or to explicitly point out, that this expression is only for t equals 0. Prior to t equaling 0, for before that switch, if, if we were in looking at some circuit, um, prior to that, everything would have been 0, or it would have been accounted for in the initial conditions. So that's our process. We'll have a circuit. We'll analyze the circuit in terms of its... Um, Laplace variables will come up with an expression for a voltage or current, any voltage or current in the circuit. We'll then use this partial fraction expansion process to identify individual fractions, which we can then transform back into the time domain, and that gives us the time domain response of our, um, of our circuit. Notice, going back to classical differential expressions, differential equation expressions, you'll recall that the step response for this type of a circuit would have been in the form A1e to the S1t plus A2e to the S2t plus some final voltage or current x final value. And isn't that exactly what we have? Some constant e to the some constant times t plus another constant another exponential term plus the final value associated with it. Laplace transforms is an awfully complicated way to solve this kind of a simple problem. We're doing it on a simple problem just first of all to just show the process but I think hopefully you can see how Laplace transforms are going to lend themselves to analyzing very nice but complicated circuits involving much more complicated or interesting um, sources going into it.